just arrived this weekend, and he's going to stay until when? Until just after my lecture on okay. Thursday, uh, so Wednesday. They, so you should ask him a lot of questions. Yeah. So David is a professor at the Columbia University in New York. Uh, he has done a lot of work on different, uh, many, many different topics, uh, and I would say mostly clustered around glasses, uh, with mostly on dynamics, and dynamical heterogeneity, mode coupling, and all these things, and also on quantum uh, systems, where he did a lot of work on uh, um, any body localization, dynamical mixed theory, and many other topics. So you can check. So today, is, uh, I mean, this week is going to talk about uh, the most popular theory. So it will basically uh, continue what the Pintia started and the discussion of the debate, the discussion of the, of the dynamics of class. Thank you, Francesco. So can people hear me? Does it mean that the mic is on or? Yes. Okay. Um, so, the, actually, in some sense, I think what I'm going to talk about will seem quite different than what Leticia was talking about until maybe uh, two lectures in or something. And then I may, uh, what I'm going to try to do is connect what I'm going to tell you about today and probably parts of tomorrow um, with the phenomenology of uh, mean field spin glasses uh, to try to assess what the meaning of what I'm go going to derive today is. But what I'm going to talk about today is uh, really uh, looking at things from the perspective of classical fluids. And so in some regards, it will, it will at first be more connected to, let's say, Ludovic's simulations in terms of the things that I'm calculating and so on. Um, also, please interrupt me. I'm actually very hungover. And the likelihood that I actually carry out any derivation correctly is, it's like 1 over n when n is going to infinity. <laughs> um, so you have to pay attention and then stop me. Uh, also, is there chalk large enough to? There was, you had a filled one of these. What happened to, oh, there. But it's a small one. It's a small one. This one I'm stealing. I'm stealing right. Oh, here. right now. Okay. So <laughs> Maybe what I'll do is I'll start with a small piece of chalk, and we'll s we'll see how far this goes for an hour and a half. Um, or yeah, I could use the retarded giant pieces of chalk, but I and that's not politically correct. But no, I shouldn't shouldn't use that term. The, the challenged. <laughs> the <laughs> uh, um, but I, I'll reserve that to last resorts. Um, so let me, let me give you an outline, and I'm going to go slowly because I want to give you the idea. So uh, 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 at least in one regard that I think is important. And then after about one lecture, so a third of the way in, I think I'll start to skip stuff. But for the first hour, I want to try to be as explicit as possible. Uh, I, I, I think the notes that I sent to Leo are online. I noticed this morning while looking over them, there are like three or four little mistakes in them. So I'll try to correct those. Um, but it's pretty explicit at first, and then it sort of relaxes a little bit. And you don't have to um, you know, derive every little uh, equation. So, uh, and I also have no idea how, um, you know, I prepared something like 45 pages of notes, and I don't know whether that's a lot or a little. So we'll just see how it goes. Um, so the first thing that I want to do is just talk about um, a simple background. And this is just going to cover um, the kinds of observables and uh, um, things that we want to calculate uh, in a liquid uh, via what uh, I will call mode coupling theory. And some of these things I think Ludovic talked about the intermediate scattering function, g of r, s of k. So I'll just go over that again uh, uh, as I need it. <coughs> and then uh, what I'm going to derive is
So I'm going to derive, uh, use a formalism which isn't so common uh, I I compared to something like field theory, uh, which is the Maurice Wanzig approach. Uh, probably many of you have not heard of this. Uh, there are relationships between this approach and um, field theoretic approaches. So there will be something called the memory function when we derive this, which has some relationship uh, with the self-energy, which uh, Leticia mentioned. How many people in here have taken like a field theory class where you've done self-energies and diagrammatic things? Okay, so a lot of you. So it will, it will sort of look like the equation of motion that I derive here looks like the, uh, the Dyson equation for the Green's function, the one particle Green's function. It's actually not. Uh, it's a deceptively, uh, it, it, I, I think it, it, it's, it's deceptive in, in a sense that it looks very, very similar. First, first and foremost, the equation I'm gonna derive is would be for the two particle Green's function. It would be the density density correlator, which is not the one particle Green's function. In field theory, density density correlations, you need something like the beta Salpeter equation for. So there's obviously already at the very beginning something different, uh, but there are relationships, they're subtle, and I'll point out as we go some of them. The equation of motion is exact, but just like it is in your field theory class when you derive, you know, you derive the, the Schwinger-Dyson equation. It's exact, but it's not, you can't solve it. Uh, you know, all of the difficulty will be shoved into what's the equivalent of the self-energy. And then the question is, how do you approximate uh, the terms that you need to to get some useful theory? And that's what we're, we'll talk about. By the way, this approach is much more general than, um, than the application to glasses. And this is something that I want to convey because I think it's important. Uh, the, the, you know, using memory functions and the Maurice Wanzig approach is something that you see from time to time in hard condensed matter problems. So for condu conductivity problems, people will use you know, the, uh, the gutze wolf uh, approach for conductivity, and that's in terms of memory functions. Or if you look at Derry Giamarchi's book, you can see the same thing in the book. Or if you, you want to study dynamics of quantum spin, uh, spin systems, spin chains, uh, you know, this, this is a useful approach as well. And I'll touch on either very, in very great detail or almost no detail, depending on how quickly this goes. Just an example of another problem that has nothing to do with glasses, just to show you that not only the Maurice Wanzig approach can be very useful, um, but also mode coupling approaches can be very useful. So the, the uh, example that I picked was the uh, classic Frilich polaron problem, where you have a single electron in a polar medium. It's a quantum problem. You can easily write the Hamiltonian down. And uh, this is a problem that Feynman famously solved variationally for the ground state. And then in the 60s, people were interested in the mobility of that particle. And so first Feynman, uh, Hellworth, uh, Iddings, and Platzman wrote down a solution which is exceedingly complicated in terms of double path integrals. And uh, Kadanoff, two years later, wrote down a separate solution in terms of the Boltzmann equation. The, solu the two solutions disagree. There's still a debate about why they don't give the same answer. They basically, th the, the argument normally is that there's some switching of limits that are different in the two approaches. Um, but you can very, very easily Rederive the Feynman approach from the Maurice Wanzig equations and a, mo a simple mode coupling approximation in like about a fifth of the number of equations that Feynman uses. It's much easier. So I just want, I, you know, it's in the notes. If we don't do it in detail, it's useful just to show you that the approach is general beyond uh, the study of, of the glass transition. So that's, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the mode coupling approximation, which is an approximation to these exact equations uh, for, for glasses. And then I'll talk about other uh, if there's time. And uh, um, then I want to talk about the successes and failures of this approach, of this approach. Okay, and then I want to ask the question, is the theory that we derive here really a mean field theory or not? And the answer is yes and no. 
Or maybe the, a better way to answer that question is, yes, it's a mean field theory. No, it's not the right mean field theory. Um, there can be many different mean field theories, so I'll talk about that. Um, and this is confusing, what I'm saying already, because as Leticia said, if you think in terms of something like the P spin model, so P is three or greater, then of course what I will, what we'll talk about as mode coupling theory is exact for the dynamics. So of course it's the correct dynamics for that mean field model. The problem is there are many, many different uh, mean field models that have different types of equations. And in particular, what we could ask is, are the equations that I'm going to derive correct for a fluid in the limit where the dimensionality goes to infinity? And the answer is no, even though it was speculated in the 80s that the answer is yes. So we'll, we'll talk about that. It's, it, there's some features of it that seem right, but it's actually uh, also some features that become um, unphysical. And this is very strange, because it seems like it should be the version of the mean field theory for a liquid, which subsumes what we'll talk about for the P-spin model. But actually, if you just solve the equations that we'll derive today as d goes to infinity, you get unphysical results. It, the results are worse in high dimensions than they are in three dimensions. Uh, which is not what you want your mean field theory's properties to be. Um, and then if we have time, what I want to talk about is uh, the same type of theory for dynamical heterogeneity. That is, what would we do if we wanted to calculate things like chi-4, s4, which I think have been discussed here Maybe uh, Gilles talked about them. Uh, maybe Julio talked about them. Maybe Ludovic talked about them. Um, but if you wanted to calculate things related to length scales associated with dynamical heterogeneity, it seems like a mean field theory is a bad idea. But then, of course, you remember in the icing model, you have a growing length scale, and that's a mean field theory. So there's nothing intrinsically wrong with doing, trying to do the same thing from the standpoint of, um, of the glass transition. And there is a way to do that within exactly the same formalism that I'll talk about here. It's complicated, but so I won't do it in detail, but I'll sketch what the solution looks like, where it comes from, and what the predictions are in terms of uh, dynamical exponents uh, and the growth of length scales, which turn out to be wrong, but not wrong in a, in, in a way you, would, you, you wouldn't expect a mean field theory to be wrong. That is, it's qualitatively right over some density or temperature regime. So that's basically the outline, and, uh, and we'll just see how far we get. Okay, so the kinds of things that I want to discuss or calculate, uh, we're going to treat a, real, a realistic liquid system. So by realistic, what I mean is something like a Leonard-Jones fluid, um, or we, could do, we can do harder things than that. Uh, I'll actually show some results tomorrow pertaining to trying to do mode coupling calculations on something like silica, which is more complicated than uh, Leonard Jonesium and has directional uh, bonding in, uh, in the liquid, and, and uh, there's interesting things that come out of that. So I want to calculate uh, a correlation function, and I'll, in a second, I'll tell you what specific correlation function we're going to focus on. And I think about this, although it's never really important, as just the canonical uh, uh, partition function, uh, uh, correlation function. But it allows me to introduce some notation, which I'll use later. So this will be, everything that we're going to do is for equilibrium. And by the way, this is another thing that's kind of interesting. Um, in some ways, uh, what we're going to derive here for realistic fluids is a much more direct approach to getting at a particular type of uh, uh, equations that we want to solve than would be a field theoretic approach. That is, in the last 15 years, there have been a lot of attempts, including by us and by Leticia and by other people, to write down the field theoretic version of this. Uh, and it's very, very hard to get to the same equations. The reason why you would want to do that, though, is that field theory is much better when you want to look at out of equilibrium problems. So exactly what Leticia was talking about an hour ago, when you really have an aging problem or a, qu uh, a quench problem, and you want to look at the response function and the correlation function separately, this is not a good way. That is, it's a very, very 
it's very, very uh, tightly tied to the equilibrium structure of the theory. And so one can try, and I think that there's partial success in doing this to generalize this, but everything that we're going to talk about is equilibrium. So this is going to be something just like uh, the canonical um, distribution. And L is what I'll call the Liouville operator. And basically what this is, is if I have a, a variable and I want to take the time derivative of it, this, I'm defining this to be where uh, I L is the Poisson bracket of uh, the variable A in the Hamiltonian. And for us, because we're going to deal with simple classical liquids, I'll just take a very simple Hamiltonian, which is separated into kinetic energy parts plus pair, I'm going to assume pairwise uh, potential energy. Okay, so if this is the Hamiltonian, then, uh, and I know that the Poisson bracket of two variables is just defined in the following way. So that's, that's the Poisson bracket. Then this is the generator of dynamics for it. And so e to the ILT is like the propagator. And in fact, actually from this Hamiltonian, we can just explicitly write down what, the, uh, what that operator is for our model of a liquid. Of course, this is not really useful to us. None of this is useful to us. You know, we could say, oh, well, we want to calculate a correlation function. I need to calculate something like this. Right, and well, I just take this operator and I apply this, but I mean, that's basically doing a computer simulation. Okay, in fact, it's not quite because I think Ludovic talked about the difference between micro-canonical simulations and canonical simulations. Everything here, this would be like my canonical correlation function, but you don't do really do computer simulations that way. At least I don't. And I saw Ludovic's video. He says he turns the thermostat off also. So, uh, you know, you would do some micro-canonical simulation and your correlation function would be uh, for fixed total energy, right? kinetic energy and the potential energy are fluctuating. The total energy is conserved unless you're taking two large time steps or you have a very bad integrator. So that's just a mistake. And you run your simulation, you run your trajectories, and you run many of them, and you time average to get the correlation function. And in fact, actually, if you want to do a little bit better, you might sample your, your initial conditions from the canonical distribution, but you're running micro-canonical trajectories, and then you just average over them and get the correlation function. Everything that I'm going to calculate is thinking about it in the canonical ensemble, and I'm going to assume that for large numbers of particles and for equilibrium situations, ergodicity works, and I don't care what ensemble I'm in. So everything should be the same as what I can compare to a, uh, to a computer simulation. Now, I am going to assume dynamics like this, and dynamics like this are Newtonian dynamics. Right, I'm not going to assume Langevin dynamics. And then it's a, a less trivial 
thing to to uh, to, a to ask and answer the question. Well, then you know, are the results you're going to get the same as if you were comparing to you know, this is for Newtonian dynamics to Langevin dynamics? And actually, it, it turns out that we don't really have to worry about that, and the answer is yes. But it's it's uh, it's not obvious why that should be true. Okay. So and also one can carry through the calculations that I'm going to that I'm going to do now. These calculations. Uh, with Langevin dynamics too. It's actually harder, so I'm not going to do it. Okay, so what kinds of uh, correlation functions do I want to calculate? Well, um, for the theory that I'm going to work out, I mostly want to talk about density fluctuations. So I can think about classical density field where I just put a delta function on all the particles and I follow them around. Okay? And I can Fourier transform this so that I can think about a variable uh, like this, which is just the take take this, multiply by e to the i k dot r and integrate over all R, and you'll get a sum of plane waves. So this is what I'll call the density mode. And the correlation function that I'm going to uh, be most interested in is what Ludovic called the intermediate scattering function. It's Yes. Yeah, I'm just saying that there's some momentum and some position uh, variables for our classical fluid, which would be what I later hear sloppily call change to R. So P and R are P and Q. Just, I'm just thinking about configurational coordinates and momentum coordinates or velocity coordinates. And it's classical, so I can separate everything. Um, kinetic energy term separates from the potential energy term. So, um, and the correlation function that I'm envisioning here is the canonical one. Just because I want to think of it this way. It doesn't, doesn't have to be. It, it's actually easy to do the grand canonical case. The micro canonical case is, is not, it, it's not easy to do. But as I said, we're not going to worry about uh, the distinction. So this Correlation function um, is uh, probably Ludovic told you everything about it in glasses. I just want to go over this a little bit if you forgot the behavior that we expect. So if you uh, do a computer, well, first let's talk about what k, how you should think about the wave vector here. Okay? Um, so in a very crude zeroth order way, you should think that large k is small length scales and small k are hydrodynamic length scales. So really, this correlation function is measuring something like, you know, over some length scale, and this is actually wrong, but it's good enough, over some length scale L, which is like, uh, you know, um, related to k by uh, 2 pi over that length scale. We're measuring, if we looked at the fluctuations of the density, what we're doing is we're measuring, you know, on average, what the uh, number of particles that are coming in and out of this sphere in the fluid are. So <coughs> at very, very large k, we're probing very, very small length scales, and the dynamics should be very, very fast in general. And at, as k goes to zero, this is the hydrodynamic limit. And if you really took that seriously, then this is just the total number of particles, and that's conserved in the limit where k goes to zero. So that's the diffusive or hydrodynamic limit. And actually, that's, that's important for the way we want to think about things, because um, in some sense, if you read the literature, the old literature starting from the 70s, 60s, and 70s on uh, mode coupling theory, you hear of things called slow variables. So for example, if I take uh, this density mode, 
or this density variable, and I take its time derivative, which we will consider as well just because it's useful. Right, this is just going to bring down a factor of IK times the velocity of the particles. And this is equal to It's equal to I times the magnitude of the wave vector times something that I'll call the longitudinal current. Which is just the sum over I of the direction of K dotted into this vector uh, IT. So it's the current uh, along the direction of K. Okay. And if I'm going to the limit where, where k goes to zero, then clearly rho dot is equal to zero because the density is conserved. But another way to think about this is that the variations of the density become slow in the limit where k goes to zero. This is the hydrodynamic limit. This is uh, basically going to help us define what we mean by slow variables in the system if we, uh, if we cared about it this way. Actually. For the derivation that I'm going to tell you about, slow or fast isn't really that useful, but it will give us physical intuition about what the exact equation of motion e uh, even is that we derive. Okay, so we could think of things like the density and the longitudinal current as two of maybe many types of slow modes in the, in the liquid system. All right, so uh, you, I, as I said before, Ludovic told us uh, what, what these... Um, correlations look like or what density density correlations look like in classical glass forming liquids. <coughs> so what do they look like? I'll remind you at very, very, let's say we pick a wave vector that's uh, something like um, 2 pi over the size of a particle. So um, that would define uh, a standard wave vector associated with the structure factor of the liquid. So if FKT and this is also, I'm sure, something that Ludovic mentioned in his, in his lectures. If I look at this at time <coughs> zero, then this is defined to be the static structure factor of the fluid. Right? This is something, both of these things, the dynamic version of this, this is just for t equals zero. And this is basically the same information that's in the radial distribution function. So where this is the density of the liquid. So if G of R looks something like this in a, in a dense fluid, Right, and that's because you've, you're asking the question for this. This is the pair distribution function. So what is the pair distribution function? It's, it's asking the question, if I stick a particle at the origin, what's the probability that I find a particle a distance r away? So it's telling me about two-point static uh, structural information. Then, and so it's basically, you're going to get, in a dense fluid, you have sort of a shell structure of the liquid. And so on uh, length scales associated with the uh, diameter of the particle, you'll have something here that's more or less sigma, and something here that's more or less two sigma, and so on. And if I Fourier transform this properly, this, this uh, static structure factor has the same information in it, but it's variable here is k. At k goes to zero, this is related to the compressibility of the fluid. And the periodicity is related to the periodicity of the shell structure in the liquid. Okay, so the zero time value of 
this correlation function you already learned about, and actually you also probably learned about the dynamics as well, and that's the static structure factor. And then we could ask the question in a, in a glass forming liquid, uh, what do we expect the behavior to be? So at very, very high temperatures, well away from the glass transition, if I plotted, you know, if I plotted FKT as a function of T or log T, it just shows a very simple decay with a simple time constant. Uh, it should be exponential in time. Uh, in fact, actually, we know uh, what to expect if we think in terms of large K, small K. So in a simple fluid, we expect, for example, that uh, in the hydrodynamic limit, we're going to get something like this, where D is the diffusion constant. So we have just exponential decay. Okay? And this, this you're going to see at pretty much all wave vectors, actually, at very, very high temperatures or low densities. But as we start to supercool the liquid, just and, and it's one way to define the onset temperature of a, uh, of, a, you know, a, of a glassy fluid, which is when you first start to see deviations from that very, very simple exponential behavior. And in particular, where you first start to see you know, the appearance of something that looks like the system wants to form a plateau. Right? So I call that, you know, that's still a very high temperature. That's very close to the crystallization temperature. And, uh, and then basically what you're going to see is a progressive behavior where this plateau, this is as a function of Um, as a function of supercooling, the system is going to slow down. But more interestingly than just slowing down, you know, instead of just having a time constant that gets uh, smaller and smaller, or larger and larger, depending on what, you, what language you like to use for slowing down, um, you start to see the appearance of multiple regimes in the dynamics. And Leticia mentioned this this morning. Okay? So the behavior that we're going to see is now I'm going to brainwash you a little bit. It's consistent with the following behavior. Whether or not you actually believe that this is really just overfitting or not, I can give you my opinion on in five minutes. Um, but what you'll start to see is that the decay into the... This, so this is like a plateau, which I'll call F. You know, there's some well-defined value. that in, the, in a real liquid, unlike in the P-spin model, that's going to depend on the wave vector. Okay? So at different K, that plateau value is going to go up, down, up, down. It's going to go up and down, actually, with the structure of the fluid. And we can think about, we can call that, sometimes we call that the Debye-Waller factor of the, of the liquid. Okay? So, uh, you know, if you plot what this plateau looks like when it's well-defined, it's going to look something like this. Okay? So this is the height of this plateau. So this is actually a K-dependent thing. For spin glass people, this plateau is like the Edwards-Anderson parameter in the fluid. And so the behavior of the decay into this plateau is consistent with something like, uh, so I'll call this the early beta regime. Like a power law. And Leticia, I think, mentioned this power law. Okay, and then I'll call the regime where you decay out of the plateau, but not, not all the way down at 1 over E, but just when you're decaying from the plateau is consistent with something like this, which we'll call the late beta regime. Okay? And in the theory that we're going to uh, develop, there is a relationship between these A and Bs. And uh, Leticia somewhat cryptically mentioned this because she didn't have time to talk about it. So, for instance, in the P-spin model, this relationship is exactly provable, and, but it's not robust in the sense that it, for P equals 3, it's different than for P equals 4, than for P equals 5, and it's different for different spin glass models, but there's always a relationship. And so for the uh, equations that I'm going to drive, the relationship is... Uh, I think this is... Right, where this is a gamma function. You can correct me if I'm wrong. 
So the question, for example, is, and since we haven't developed the theory yet, we don't know where this comes from, but I'm telling you that this is going to come out of the phenomenology that we developed. Is this consistent with Ludovic's simulation? And the answer is sort of, uh, but in my mind, it's, uh, it's wishful thinking that this is really right. But it's not grossly wrong. That is, you, you, know, you, can, you can do a fit here, and you get an A exponent, and then you plug it in, and it predicts what the B exponent is, and you can ask whether that's right, and it's not grossly wrong. Yes? So does the relaxation time also depend on K? Yes. So we, the relaxation time measured here, which is like the 1 over E time of, of the correlation function, where it's decayed by 1 over E, phenomenologically will take the form something like this. Okay, so, and beta will be less than 1. So this is stretched exponential relaxation. And uh, one of the reasons why it's sort of bullshit to uh, really hold to the idea that you can really measure this B exponent well is because where do you draw the line between the decay from 0.8 to 0.6 and then at 1 over E, the behavior is different. So this is really overfitting of a certain class, when, but when you really like the, your theory, you do this too much. So I advise you not to do it. Um, because in some sense, you could just say that this whole thing is a, is a stretched exponential and fits this. And, and it's ambiguous whether this works. But to answer your question, both the relaxation time and the stretching exponent will depend on k. And they'll depend on k in the theory that we developed. They'll depend on k in a very, uh, well, the relaxation time actually, it will depend on k in a very trivial way, which pro hopefully I won't forget to talk about. Beta will depend on K in a very non-trivial way that is a very strong prediction of the theory that is pretty reasonably well uh, observed in uh, computer experiments, for example. Okay. And it actually, the stretch exponential behavior also comes out naturally from the theory. So it, probably I was a bit glib and confusing about which of these things are seen in a real simulation, which of these come out of the theory. Uh, the things that are seen in a real simulation is that you start to see a plateau develop. The plateau is, uh, is K-dependent in its height. You see stretch exponential relaxation. These, uh, the, the beta and relaxation time are k-dependent. Those are real things. And that, you know, whether or not this is really power law-like, you know, probably it's okay to, to believe that that is. All of those things are going to come out directly from, uh, from the theory that we develop. Okay? So that's interesting. Um, and, uh, and then we, we can ask what that, what that really means. Um, okay, so I think that, oh, and one other thing that I want to note, because it's, go it's going to be important if I ever get to the last part of the lectures, which have to do with, uh, with dynamical heterogeneity, which is that you already know that you should take, um, in, in my definition of FKT, uh, by, by the way it's constructed, the sum of the wave vectors here is zero, right? So I have rho star and rho, rho star, turns k into minus k. And so the sum of the two wave vectors there are equal to zero. That's just conservation of momentum. If I had k1 here and k2 here and equilibrium fluid with, which, with translational invariance, you would get zero or you would get silliness. Okay? In, the, in our approach to deriving what we're going to derive for, um, for dynamical heterogeneity, we're going to put an external field on the system and look at the susceptibility to a spatially varying field. And then you can actually have a matrix F, which is different Ks here, such that the wave vectors of those two Ks add up to cancel out the wave vector associated with the periodic modulation or the spatial variation of the field. That's still conservation of, of momentum, but it's conservation in a less trivial way because you have an external field. You could think of the same thing in a spatially inhomogeneous system, let's say, where you have a wall or your, your fluid is con uh, confined in a box. Right? And then you also uh, have to be careful about that. All right, are there any questions? So this should all be review. Okay, so what we're going to do now is develop as far as we can um, the, uh, the notion of uh, the memory function and the maurice wanzig uh, equations for uh, our correlation function.
was that? There's a third blackboard. This one goes, oh, good. All right. Then I want to erase the other ones. I'll just stay here for a little while. All right. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to define a scalar product of functions. And you can define this however you like. So I'm going to take the simplest uh, definition. So I'm going to define a scalar product. So basically, this notation means take, uh, you know, on the bra side is the complex conjugate, on the ket side is the actual variable. And these can be, as a function, these can be dynamical, you know, it could be a of t and b of t, or, or a of t and b of t prime, and this would be a star of t, b of t prime. It's fine. Okay, we can define different ways of doing this. This is useful for classical. Uh, derivations for quantum mechanical derivations. Sometimes you'll define, you'll see uh, the derivation or the, the definition look different. So, for example, you could define something like this. This would be the static version of it. This just means e to the um, tau h a e to the minus uh, tau h. Okay, and it's integrated over this cycle in imaginary time. Right, that's called the Kubo transformation. Or you could define just the symmetrized a b plus b a. Right, I mean the reason you do this is because you get complex functions of time in the quantum mechanical case, and it's nicer to deal with just the real part. So this transformation always is real, no, even if these are operators and not classical functions, okay? Um, or just the symmetrized product is always real. A, a of t, b of zero, where a and b are operators, plus uh, b of, of t, a of zero is always, always real because you cancel out the imaginary part of the correlation function. But we're not going to worry about this. So we're just going to stick with this nicer, simple thing. We're not going to worry about operators right now. So this is our definition of a, of a scalar product. And now we're going to define a projection operator. Is that average? Or? Yes, this is the same canonical average that I would have in my definition of the correlation function itself. Okay. I mean, I've written it in a way that A and B are static functions, but they don't have to be. This could be, and then, and if A and B are both then density modes, this is, modulo a factor of the number of particles is just the intermediate scattering function. Okay, so So basically, the projection operator is just going to project whatever uh, variable you want onto A. And if it turns out that I have a matrix of classical functions, then this is a, or a vector of classical functions, and I will actually, in our derivation, we're going to choose the density mode as the first component of a vector of A. And the second mode is going to be the longitudinal current. Okay, and that means that this then is a, a two by two matrix. And so this is the matrix inverse. But if it's just projecting onto a single scalar variable, this is just a number. Right, it's, just the it's just one over a squared average. Okay, and physically, obviously, this is just, uh, you know, in some space, um, you are finding the component of your function b onto a. Right, so that's very simple. And actually, one, one use in the, in the way that I was talking about the language before of slow modes is if I think about the hydrodynamic modes of the system, I can, if I think that I've selected 
all of the hydrodynamic modes. And I think those are going to be the things that are most important at longest times. And I want a theory that's good at long times. Then I'm going to want to project onto those hydrodynamic modes to remove the component of any arbitrary variable onto the space of slow variables. So those slow variables could be the angular momentum density, the total energy density, the current density, and the particle density, for example. What we're going to see, one of the lessons of mode coupling theory is that what you think is slow, you haven't done a good enough job. That there's always an infinite number of slow modes in the system. So if the density is a slow mode, a product of densities is also a slow mode. And three, pro three density times density times density is also a slow mode. Okay, and you can't ever win. There's always going to be an infinite hierarchy of slow modes in the system. And that's why problems are hard and physics is interesting. Um, because otherwise, everything would look like just Brownian motion. And it would be very, very simple to solve. And we'll see why that's true in a second. So these are our two definitions of things. Um, and now what I want to do is write down uh, the exact equation of motion for the time dependence of a variable A. OK, so right, where I've already defined I times the Liouville operator, right? That's just that complicated sum over derivatives and so on. That's just, that's uh, the time dependence. This is the same thing as And of course, L, remember, is an operator. So even though I'm dealing with classical mechanics, this is like a quantum mechanical operator because it's, you know, it's like the gradient operator or something. But still, IL commutes with E to the ILT. So I can move this inside, too. Doesn't matter. OK, so what I want to do is I want to take this here. And I want to write it in a way that looks like uh, I haven't done anything. And so far, it will mean that I haven't done anything. So I'm just going to move this IL inside. And I'm going to insert P plus 1 minus P. OK, so this is exact. P is my projection operator. right? That's I've already defined it. It's under here. This is bad use of Blackboard. But it's just this. Okay, so p plus 1 minus p is 1. So I can insert 1 wherever I want to. And sometimes it's a useful and a good shorthand notion, I'll call this q. So it's the complementary projection operator to p. So physically, or sort of quasi physically, because there's no physics in this, um, p projects onto some variable of my choice or set of variables of my choice. q is the complementary projection operator. It projects it onto the space orthogonal to p. Right? So for example, we, you can easily show that p squared equals p, but you can also show that p times q equals 0. Why? Because it's p minus p times p, which is p, which is equal to 0. So this q is the projector onto the space co uh, that, that is the orthogonal complement of P. Yes? Hmm? Yes, right. So I haven't even said what I want to choose A to B, but P is, is just this. Whatever your favorite thing is, now I really have to find a longer piece of chalk. So pick your favorite A. And this is P. Is that answering your question? What is different about that A? Uh, it doesn't have to be different than this A. Okay. All right. And in, in our derivation, it actually will not be different than this A. So you, it, it really seems stupid. I mean, it seems like we're not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. But you'll see we'll go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. No, it's just a normalization. Right. I mean, but you would, you would, uh, it, it's going to make our life easier um, to have properties like that. For example, p squared wouldn't be equal to p if we didn't normalize uh, things properly. Uh, right? So even in the case that 
Say again? Even in the case that it's a matrix. Mm -hmm. Yes, just a, it's a matrix normalization. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, so. So let's look at separately P acting on this. So P acting on uh, so this ILA is just A dot, right? So this is just this in reserve. Okay, so P acting on this is this, and we can give this a name. Uh, we say that this is equal to so I omega is defined to be uh, the inner product of A with A dot normalized by A with itself. And if, again, if uh, A is a vector, Omega is a matrix. It's a two by two matrix. Uh-huh. In the definition of P, it's A of zero, right? It's A of zero. And here also A of zero for omega. It's 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 all it's A of zero. So this is a static matrix. But of course, if I do this, this is going to be A of T because this E to the I L T is gonna come along and bite on the A that's left over in the projection. All right. So basically what I have so far is right the omega is static it's just a static matrix we'll calculate it and this is a of t so it just looks like a sort of a harmonic oscillator term right and then there's this other part So this is, and, and this is zero, right? This is a time zero. The time dependence comes from here. Okay, so this is my equation of motion so far. I haven't gone anywhere. Okay, now I'm going to do the one trick that makes this all useful. And then I'll explain to you why I did it, because at first it's going to look absolutely and utterly arbitrary. But it, it, you'll see that it's exact. Uh, no. I took P and I acted it on ILT, uh, ILA. This is this uh, without any time dependence is A zero. But when I come, then I can come along, and this is all just a number. So this can act on this, and it will give me A of T. Yeah, but the A dot is inside a, a, uh, an inner product. It's a number. So these are both at time zero, right? But this whole thing, whether they're matrices or scalar things, is just a number. It's just a, a quantity that's not, that has no functional character. It's not a function of P and Q. So E to the I, the propagator doesn't care about it. It just goes right through it. This. Uh huh. Correct. Zero is this, and this is zero. And then what I should say is if I take e to the i l t on this, that is this. No, I act the p first. I can put the, at first I can put the e to the i l t anywhere because it commutes with i l a. It commutes with i l, right? So I put it on this side. I act this statically on this, right? I get the omega matrix. I get a a dot divided by a a. That is a static number quantity. It has no functional qu uh, character. And then I take the propagator and I act on the A that's remaining. Remember when I project, I have an A left over. It projects onto A. So uh, the definition might still be here. 
whenever I project, there's an A produced. It's this A that's hanging out over here that the E to the ILT snacks on and turns it into an A of T. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. I don't have to assume anything. I mean, the only thing that will really f fuck me up is if uh, I have a matrix here and that matrix has zero modes in it and, and, and the inverse isn't well-defined. But I'm going to assume it's well-defined. Okay, so now what I want to do is the following. I, I now I want to deal with this term. Yeah, it's on it's on the static a at time t. Right. Actually, so in that sense, my projection operator. It's a good question. The projection operator is a static projection operator. If you want to try to do what field theory does so well for you, which is do out of equilibrium problems where you separ separate the response function and the correlation functions, then what you could try to do is dynamically generalize the projection operator to be a dynamical projection operator, right? And then you and it makes the derivation more complicated, and you can tr you can do this, but it leads off into it one big mess. Um, so I'm not going to talk about it. So it's a zero. Yeah. Right. Okay. So maybe this is. Uh, uh, I'll just say it. I'll keep it in the corner. Um, a zero B A zero A zero inverse A zero. That's here. Okay, good. This was the board I wanted. Okay, so I want to I do something with this term. This term I'm going to keep. I like it. It looks nice. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that let's just make an ansatz. and I want to find O. Now, why am I doing this? What we're going to see is we want to make this look like a Langevin equation. Okay? And I've already told you that P might, in our way of thinking, might project into the slow space. I pick some variables and I say these evolve slowly in time. So P privileges those degrees of freedom and 1 minus P is the complementary projection operator and that means that everything evolving in that space is fast. Right? Those are all the modes that aren't slow. And so what I want to do is I want to write this additively separated so that I have a projector that projects evolution in the fast space. And this is going to lead to the definition of what you already sort of know as a fluctuating force. Okay? But this is just an, uh, going to be an identity from which I can find O. So what I do to find O is I take the derivative of this side and I take the derivative of this side. Okay? So I take the derivative of this side, I get I l e to the i l t. I take the derivative here and there's an l. All right, that's easy. Okay, now what I do is I take this and I plug in what's on the right-hand side because this is an identity. So all of this I plug in here and I get I L E to the I L T O. Okay, 
Now I can start canceling off terms. So I have an IL e to the ILT O, and I have an IL e to the ILT O, so goodbye, goodbye. Okay, and I basically then I can isolate this term. Now look, I times 1 L e to the I 1 minus PLT, and I L 1 e to the I 1 minus PLT. I can cancel the 1 here. And then it gets rid of this also. <coughs> so let me put this all the way up and this all the way down. And I'll just stay below it, and then I'll actually use the blackboards as I'm supposed to. Because this is the only, only strenuous, it's not strenuous, but the only weird part of the derivation that I Okay, so what do I have left over? I have e to the i l t o dot equals um, right i p l e to the i one minus p l t. Okay, and what's the initial condition on o? Just set t to zero. What does O have to be? Zero, right? E to the ILT at t equals zero is one. E to the one minus p LT at t equals zero is one. So o, at o of zero has to be zero. So that's I can integrate that now. So I move this over to this side. There's a mistake. There's a, a typo that I that's in the notes. This is. Okay, I integrate this using that initial condition, and e to the i l t times o of t will equal integral from zero to t d tau e to the uh, let's see minus t or no e to the t minus tau l t i P L e to the I one minus P L T tau. Okay, and so that's I multiplied by the e to the I L T because that's what I need up there, and so it's going to be what is under the integral here, and that's exact. Okay, so now let's collect. Now we have all the terms we need. Yes. This one, I wrote it down. I wanted it to, I want it to be true, and it could, you know if I can find a solution for it, it's true. Uh, in in five or ten minutes, you'll I'll, you'll see why I wanted it to be true. Okay, but it's a, it's an operator identity for an operator O of t which is an operator because it's in terms of Liouville operators. So even though it's classical, it's an operator, right? Is that a famous trick? Is it famous? Um, it's famous. There are tricks like this that you see in statistical physics a lot. Um, and so I don't know. It's famous to me. I, I, I don't really know how to define it. I don't know how many pe I, I haven't taken a poll to know how many people know it. But uh, I feel like it's less these kinds of tricks well the the whole approach we're using is is not so widely used anymore so i wouldn't say that it's um i i don't know too many textbooks where you see it um that's a really bad answer to your question Are there three boards here too? Good. All right. So now this is what we have. So uh, using this, we can say the following. We uh, <coughs> we have the following.
Okay, so that, that's just transcribing a lot of the garbage uh, to you know I, I use that definition uh, and I use I separate that out into two terms. Okay, remember the way I wrote it. I wrote it as e to the i l t o plus that. So here's e to the i l t o, and then I also have to add, uh, that. So if I wanted to act e to the i l t on this guy, which is the second the part of the second term after the i omega a, then I can write it out as the e to the i l t o part plus the term that's left over from the e to the i one minus p l t. Okay, and I call this the fluctuating force. And let's think physically for a second. So this this will have all the components of what you would expect in Brownian motion or something to be a fluctuating force. Why? Because remember, I said that my space, my projector P, I could, if I want, to, I could project onto all the slow modes in the world if I knew them, and then one minus P or Q. Uh, propagates or lives in the space orthogonal to that. So if I've selected all the slow modes, then 1 minus P projects out all the fast modes. Okay, so what is the fluctuating force? It says take the time derivative of A, project it into the space of fast modes, and propagate it in the space of fast modes. That's what you would, this is a force because it's a der time derivative, right? So it's a force projected into the space of fast modes and then propagated in that space. Yes? Well, the projection operator automatically does that because P times Q is zero. So Q is orthogonal to P. The, the better question is how do I know all the fast modes? And the answer is you don't. So I, uh, the, I'm not going to do it, but you can use this approach uh, to drive rigorously a theory of Brownian motion, for example. And you think you know what the fast and slow modes are. They have to do with the momentum associated with the fluid and, the, and that of a big sphere. So one is big and one is small, little p and big p. Big p is the momentum associated with the, a big colloidal particle, and little p is the momentum associated with all the fluctuating fluid particles. Okay? But, but hold on for one second. So. So I, I do this, and this was done by Mazur and Oppenheim, Peter Mazur in 1970. And you can do this rigorously, and then what you find is that there are additional slow modes in the system that are related to the long time tails in the system that do or don't exist. If you then rigorously do this as a function of the ratio of the masses between the big and slow modes, at least the equation that we're going to get allows you to rigorously do a perturbation theory to leading order, leading orders in the ratio of of little m to big M, where little m is the mass of the little particles and big M is the mass of the big particles. But, but really, in general, for any interesting problem, you can't remove all the slow modes by this trick. So this is a fluctuating force by expectation. But it will turn out that this fluctuating force also has slow degrees of freedom in it. So I don't know if that answered your question, but maybe we can... I'm sort of running out of time, so come and ask me right after. Uh, okay. So that's, that's our um, definition of the fluctuating force. Now what I can do is I can put uh, everything together. Now, there are a few properties of the fluctuating force I want to mention. And they're, they're a little bit tricky, but, but they're very, very useful. So for example, the fluctuating force at any time is orthogonal to A. So this is zero. Why is that true? Because the fluctuating force, let's do a Taylor expansion of this, right? I already have a 1 minus p down here. So I've got 1 plus i 1 minus p lt plus the square of that over 2, blah, 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 blah. So this has all orders, its, uh, its leading order term is 1 minus p. So when that 1 minus p acts on a, right, it, uh, it's orthog a is orthogonal to 1 minus p. So this will always be true. This is super useful in many places in the next five minutes. Okay, so uh, <coughs> what I'm going to do now is I, I think I erased it, but I had an equation. <laughs> and I think it's gone. So hopefully this won't look strange. And I'll, I'll say in words where it came from. 
So remember what I was trying to do, because this has been about 20 minutes of doing this. I have an equation for dA dt, right? The first term in that equation is I omega A of t. Right? It's sort of just a, uh, what's called in hydrodynamics a free streaming term, right? It's, it's sort of like a harmonic oscillator term or something like that. And then I did all this bullshit with this guy to write it out like this and write it into two parts. One is this and one is this. So what's left now is uh, the following. And I, okay. Um, and I'll, I'll say where this comes from in a, in a second. Okay, so I haven't defined K yet, um, but what I, what I have is I've got, remember that this is the term that I separated out. So I have, I'm going to have a term in my equation for dA dt that's just this on the right side, okay? Now I'm going to actually calculate IPLF, right? And that's going to leave me, so let's, let's write down what that is. times um, right now I can move this over to this side of the equation it's just integrating by parts This is zero, okay? And I can actually insert a one minus p here because the p acting on LA is going to give me zero for the same reason. But then what this looks like, it looks like negative the autocorrelation function of the fluctuating force times A, A times A, zero. Now, where does this a to the t minus, so that, this is k. Uh, that's what's called the memory function, okay? And the remaining uh, e to the i l t here comes and acts on the a that's left over from the projection and turns it into a of t minus tau. So that's where this comes from. Okay, so I want to explain to you just for five minutes how great this equation is. <laughs> anyway, it's exact, first of all. It's an exact equation of motion for A in terms of a very simple free streaming term, which is just a number or a matrix that's static times A itself. And then a time retarded term in terms of what's called a memory function and A at some earlier time and a fluctuating force. Okay? And the memory function is the autocorrelation function of the fluctuating force at time zero with itself at time t normalized by, by the A, A uh, overlap. And this is exact. It's, this is the Langevin equation. This is the exact Langevin equation that is true in, you know, Exactly. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is, this is what's under the hood there. This is, the minus sign here came from this minus sign. Yes? Uh, I. Thanks. Two typos. Um, 
There is one very, very, well, there are two very tricky things here. One of them is obvious and one of them is not obvious. First, this looks nice, but I don't know what K is. So you could think if you're a field theory person, K is something like the self-energy. Right, this, I mean, when I, uh, I'm going to write this out in a second for the correlation function, right? All I have to do to get the t uh, an equation of motion for the correlation function and not the variable itself is multiply by A of zero here. Multiply by A of zero here. Multiply by A of zero here and multiply by A of zero here, right? And then just take the average. And remember, F at any time is orthogonal to A. So that term will go away. That is, I'm going to, I'll just do it. I multiply by A of 0 here, 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 right? Then I take the average of what's left over, average, average, average. This average is 0. And so I get an exact equation of motion, which is just this. where I'm defining C of t to be A of t, A of 0, average correlation function. This is exact. So it sort of, in a, in a, slightly perverted way looks like the Dyson equation where K is like a self-energy, but this is very deceptive. Um, and actually, I have a colleague named Igor Liner and I had a big argument with him about this because you can do this for, for quantum problems also. And, and if you have a non-equilibrium problem, you can do this, you have an initial source term. And this is exact. And he said, no, 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 Keldish, Keldish, Keldish. So it's true that in Keldish, you, uh, which I don't know if Leticia mentioned or not. Okay, so there's a way to do out of equilibrium Green's functions and you, you have to worry about uh, like five different Green's. You have a, a time ordered Green's function, a, con you know, a, a contour ordered Green's function, a greater or lesser Green's function. You have to do all these tricks because you're working on, on a contour in space in time for T and T prime. Here there's no T and T prime. So why, how am I able to do this? Why is that? Th it seems better. It's not better though because this time evolution for the fluctuating force is in terms of this projected uh, 1 minus p propagator. And that's really hard to deal with. So in the, in the true self energy, you never have this. You have regular uh, dynamics. In the memory function, you have these weird projected dynamics. So really, if I were to write out what this is, this is uh, the fluctuating force at time zero, e to the one minus p l t times the fluctuating force at time zero. That's what that term is. And this is star. Okay, that's, if you really want to show that this is equivalent in even in equilibrium to Schwinger Dyson, you have to do a lot more work than you would think. I've done it, um, but I'm not going to do it here. So this is deceptively simple, but this equation is exact. And now all we have to do is just, you know, solve it. But all of the difficulty, just like it is for, for field theory and all the difficulties in the self energy, all the difficulties in the memory function. Okay. But it has, you know, especially this equation, the, the equation for A itself, it has this beautiful form of a generalized Langevin equation and it's exact. So it's the, it's the rigorous way to derive a generalized Langevin equation, right? There is nothing approximate about it. And even the notion of what the fluctuating force and the memory function in terms of the autocorrelation of the fluctuating force is rigorously true. Now, you have to interpret the fluctuating force the way I did, but otherwise this is exactly a good starting point for rigorously defining in any system uh, a sort of Langevin-like dynamics and behavior. Okay, so actually one other thing, we're in a second, I will start even though I have only five minutes just to define things and then we'll pick it up tomorrow, but we're going to actually be dealing with an A that is a vector, which we can do, 
And the vector I'm going to choose is going to be the density fluctuation and the longitudinal current. All right, so remember what that is. This guy is um, sum over i e to the i k dot r. And if I m subtract its average, that's uh, 2 pi cube density times uh, delta k. All right, that's the average of this. And then this guy is just sum over all i uh, k hat dot v uh, i of t, or 0 in this case, if we e to the i k dot r i. This, if we can define everything at time 0. So that's going to be my a. I'm going to have a, and remember, this guy is just related to the time derivative of this guy. So it seems dumb. Right? They, they look like they have the same information, but it's, gonna, it's a, just a useful trick. We'll see. And that means that this is going to be a 2-by-2 a, a, a two two matrix. Its first element is going to be uh, del rho, del rho, then del rho j, then j del rho, and then j, j. And the, you know, it's going to give a C that is a, a matrix, which is of this form, let's say. And omega is going to be a matrix. So this is a ma these, this, this matrix multiplication. This is the fluctuating force is going to be a 2 by 2 matrix. It turns out that the 2 by 2 matrix, one of the reasons you choose this is it makes the memory matrix really simple. It's three zero elements plus one non-zero element. So it's going to be 0, 0, 0, and then something that we'll calculate. And this is a matrix. OK, so what we're going to do um, starting next time is just Take this, plug it into the equation, right? We'll get, uh, you know, a matrix equation. We're actually only going to care about one of the elements. And by focusing on one of the elements in that matrix equation, we are going to be able to write down a uh, exact equation for the, for the, uh, um, the intermediate uh, uh, scattering function, okay? Then what we have to do, then with this, so that's the first step. That's easy. That will take us five, ten minutes because we already have this. But then what we have to do is uh, deal with this guy. And this we don't know how to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at what the form of the fluctuating force is. And the form of the fluctuating force is very interesting. It, it has two terms, but the most important term is, as you might guess, a force, right? Because it's a fluctuating force. And you can write out the force on particles as, and many of you have done this when you've dealt with, let's say, quantum problems, a force generally can be written as something like uh, sum over all k, k times uh, some function of k times rho minus k, rho k. All right, that's just the Fourier transform of a function that depends on i minus j. Okay? That means the fluctuating force looks like a pair of density modes. That's very important. So this then takes us back to the early 60s, first with Marshall Fixman, who was at Colorado State still. Uh, no one knows this, but he sort of started this. And then Kadnoff picked it up, Kadnoff and Swift, and then Kawasaki in the late, uh, mid to late 60s to try to understand dynamics near critical points. And it was the observation that the memory function, uh, even if I thought I projected out the density, which is a slow mode near a you know, power law decaying critical point, it's, it's inside, living inside the memory function is something that depends on products of densities. And so that's what mode coupling is in this language, that I'm going to couple a single density mode to a product of density modes. And so basically what we're going to do is turn this memory function into an autocorrelation function of pairs of density modes. And then it looks like something like related to the polarization propagator in field theory for density correlation functions. It will just be something like density, 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 density. And then what do you do with that? Well, you throw up your hands and say, well, I'll just factorize this into a product of two terms. Each of them is FKT, right? And that will close the equations. I will get a nonlinear integral differential equation 
which you might even ask, does it have unique solutions? It amazingly mathematically does, and they're very interesting. Uh, so the form of the equation is going to be something like dF dt is proportional to something times f, and then something times ff times something related to f. And then everything is closed. All I'll need are structural pieces of information, like the uh, static structure factor, temperature density, and then I can plug that into the equation and solve it, either smartly, like Leticia was saying, or just iterate it on the computer. And then all of this sort of crazy behavior where this plateau appears with a power law exponent a and, a and an exponent b and stretch exponential behavior and a Debye Waller factor or a plateau that depends on k in a funny way, all of these things will come out. And then we could ask, is this right? I mean, does it actually uh, recapitulate what we see in experiment? Does it recapitulate uh, what we see in, uh, in computer simulation? And the answer is, is I mean, sort of. It, it, it seems to work well over the first few decades of, uh, slow, of, of you know, slowing down. Uh, as we, it doesn't, it, it, it's not meant to be, and it will not be a theory of the glass transition. Right? It will not get us as far as the kinds of things that maybe other people uh, like Jill uh, summarized. But it will be also very interesting to ask, well, what does it mean in the framework of something that might be a complete theory of the glass transition? Maybe it's just a part of that theory. And that's sort of that where we can make connections to things like mean field spin glasses, high, high dimensionality and high dimensional behavior, and then ask, you know, what, what does this all mean? So that's what we'll start to do. Uh, I think it's at 9 in the morning tomorrow. Um, so you should remember all of this. Come in ready to ready to do it, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to plug this in, get this uh, equation in terms of these two variables, and then just spend a half hour on the memory function, and we'll be done with mode coupling theory. Then what we can do is look at the predictions of the theory and, uh, and go from there. So thank you. <laughs> Questions?